object means like a heap allocated in this quite expensive in Java. We have about one word, ing heap per heap allocated object. So it's one for the constructor and then count the fields. One field, two field, three fields. So the first example here takes two words, one for the constructor, one for the field. When I say one for the field, I mean um, it's basically a pointer to the field. In this case, right? So and the, the first field could be like, I don't know, a vector of, of ints. Obviously, the vector of ints is not one word, but the pointer to that value. So basically, you apply this um, reasoning um, recursively. Okay, you go to, to this data type. Let's say Uno contained a dual. Right? You say, okay, one for the Uno constructor, one for the pointer to the A. And then you go down, okay, what's the dual? One for the constructor of the dual, and one for each of the ints of five words. Uh, so that's a rule of thumb. Um, that's the first thing you need to know. The second thing you need to know, there are a number of basic types in, in Haskell, right? Word 16, Word 8, Word 64, in char, and some of these basic types. All the basic types basically take one word, um, with a few exceptions. A double will take two words in a 32-bit 30, machine because it's a 64-bit value. Um, and there are some native types, like the byte array, etc., that has some um, other fixed costs. I have a whole uh, table of that I can give you after if you can just look it up. But the basic principle is one plus the number of fields. Um, so there's an example, which is like bigger instead. Can you see the boxes up there? Roughly? Yeah. Okay, so this is a list, uh, as you list one, two. So this is one to our integers in this case. Um, and they could be overloaded literal, so it could be something else. But this, here's integers. So we can use this exact principle. So the cons constructor, like the list node constructor, the colon, takes um, uh, one word, right? So that's the first box. Yes, first box. One word for the constructor. Then there's the first field in the cons cell, right? Remember, the cons cell has a pointer to the element and a pointer to the tail. So the pointer to an element is a pointer to an int. And what does an int look like in, in heap? Well, the int itself has a constructor, which we usually call i hash. The hash is not mal and the hash is not magical, it's just a naming convention. And then in this heap allocated box is the real integer value one. It's a God honest machine word value. And then the console has a pointer in the tail, points to the next console, and console, and the same thing repeats. Um, one thing to note here is, if you have a value which is um, static, right? So the nil, nil, the empty list, it's all the same. That's not payload, it's a, a nullary constructor. It can be shared in the whole program. It's statically allocated somewhere, and it points to, every, every list points to the same thing. Because it's immutable, that's, that's a fine thing to do. So it doesn't cost us anything. Um, <coughs> so, so we can count how many words uh, of memory is this one, two, three, four, five, and ten. Ten words to represent the list, linked list of length two with integers. Yeah, oh, randomly jumps, like we like, go down by one. Anyway. Um, question on integers, is this somehow also, are you also shared in theory? I mean, integer one is probably very common. Um, yeah, so it's not guaranteed. So GC, in fact, like many kind of GC based languages, the Python's interpreted as this too, has a small pool of small integers that are cached and shared. So when you allocate them at first, they're not shared. But when the GC comes around and mocks the, the data structure, it might replace some things at the point to achieve uh, a shared small integer, uh, which is useful. Uh, I don't think it's good to rely on, but yeah, it is. Well, why do you need the i hash words? Um, so, all uh, standard values in Haskell are, are boxed values, or heap allocated values. So, including the integers. So, the integer one is actually a heap allocated value. Every heap allocated value needs this extra garbage collector, garbage collection thing. And this i hash is the constructor of the heap allocated int, so it contains. Um, that's about where the extra word comes from. You can think about it as you know, if you didn't have the box, you couldn't really do laziness, right? If you have a function that returns an int, it can be a thump right now. Because it's a pointer to something on the heap, which can be a thump and not necessarily what the field has. Right, so like a uniform kind of pointer based representation allows you to uh, find some set of values. So the first word can also be used to negate a thump. 
it, it, no, I'd rather think about in, in this list, it's not the first word in I hash that could be the time. This whole pointer could point to some completely different structure, which was not this heap allocated int. It could point to a closure data type that somehow represents the time. And then that could be much bigger than that. Like maybe it captures a bunch of variables or something like that. Um, so um, where, like if you, if it turned us all the way down, if everything is heap allocated, you know, does the I hash thing point to another I hash, but like where does it end? So GHC has a number of unboxed or predefined type, as I mentioned, one per keyword type you can think of. Um, they have different names from your standard types that we call like int hash or double hash. The hash means nothing, it's just a convention to set them apart. They are the real machine um, values. They cannot appear on the heap by themselves. They only appear in, in one of these boxes, like I hash boxes. Um, they cannot contain thumbs, as we said. If, if you just have a single box that is just an int, that cannot also contain a pointer sometimes. Because then the garbage collector wouldn't know what to do. If it traverses the structure and this is sometimes an int and sometimes a pointer, it doesn't have any extra information, it wouldn't know. So these are guaranteed to be the actual int value, double value. No, no interactions, no pointers, no types. And, and it's kind of neat because once you have those basic types, you can define a Haskell int type as nothing special. Like you could write the int type. It's just put the box around the, the, the native int hash value. So I can write data my int equals my int hash if I want to do my int without the hash, int, and then actually the actual, actual field. So the, the standard data types are not magical. We call an int, the int type a box type, and we call the int hash type an unbox type, because in essence it doesn't have a box. <coughs> so with this uh, under our belts, I would like to do a little uh, Cool. So here I have a data type, I call it int pair. It's my specialized pair that only works for ints, very useful. Um, it has a constructor, right? IP, short for int pair, and two fields of type int, so the box int. The question is, <coughs> how much space does an int pair, let's say I have the int pair um, one, I write this int pair one, two. So how much does this data, space this data type take on the heap? Including the space for the ints themselves, not just the, the pair. So I would say hands up for three. Hands up for five. Hands up for seven. Okay. Hands up for nine. Would someone like to defend the position for five? Why is it five? <laughs> <laughs> Two for each int because each int is uh, referencing the actual int. Mm -hmm. Who was the friend seven? The same thing, but you have to point to those ints, so you have one word for each pointer. Okay. Uh, okay. Here's, here's a diagram. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so this is actually seven words, right? Because it's true that the two ints have our box, so they are two each, but you also have the pointer for those boxes. So it ends up being seven. Um, seven. So that's, that's kind of bad, right? You don't have two ints around, it would be seven words, or it be two words worth of memory. It makes sense that there's some garbage collection overhead, right? It, it happens to all GC languages, but seven seems too much. Um, so if I can make it better, first, I make it smaller. Uh, so we're actually pretty well off in Haskell that we have some control over a memory layout, which is not true for most garbage collected languages, at least until recently when they realized that's a bad idea to not have any control over memory layout. For example, in Java, everything is heap object. If you want to say, if you have a class which is like uh, a line and has like you know, x1, y1, x2, y2 for the two points of the line, you said, oh, that's ugly, I'm going to wrap the x's and y's in a classical point. So now I have my line class, which has two members, point one and point two. That will not be put in the same amount of memory. You would introduce these extra boxes, and you would pay this cost. And you could not get away from that. So you have made this trade-off. I can have my nice representation, but I cost more, or I, or I can uh, not have my nice representation, and I'll get some better uh, memory layout. Um, this is changing, because that's not great, I guess. They're adding something called value types. So most, most of these languages like Scala and Java getting value types, which acts as kind of unpacked things. So, but we have something in Haskell to control this already. There's a pragmatic unpack. It is a bit wordy. 
a little bit more pretty. Maybe you should have syntax for it. But what it says is, um, please, oh, uh, GHE, you might be compiler. If you see uh, some data type uh, field of some type, and I said, uh, I said unpack before it, pretend as if I wrote the fields in line here. And please, you know, adjust all the code that uses this uh, data type such that that illusion is maintained. It looks like I still have a, a field in there, but the representation is such that uh, I mean, it's unpacking those fields with the constructor of the type. Um, it has some uh, constraints. Um, the type needs to be known, because I cannot say unpack on an A, like a type variable A, because we don't really know what the structure of A is, so we don't know how to represent that unpack. So things need to be monomorphic. Um, they need to be single constructor, because if some type here has several constructor fields of different size, um, it's hard to know how to unpack it. So one thing we say is, let's take the biggest one. This is a union in C does, or take the biggest one. Uh, that's somewhat unsatisfactory, and it might be problematic with garbage collector, because then you have to put some lines in the remaining fields. So anyway, there's some constraints. It needs to be more morphic. It needs to be strict, right? Because as someone mentioned before, if you're going to have a possibility to put a thumb in a field, then the field should point either the thumb or the real value. Once you unpack, say, an int in the constructor, there's no space for the pointer anymore. So then we cannot have a thumb. Therefore, the field needs to be strict. The plus button you would think like increases the size by one by like random randomizing the minus and four times. Uh, so here's an example. So okay, we want to do better with our int pair. So what do we do? Um, so first here we have basically the same int pair as we said before. So before actually it had the strictness annotations to those fields, meaning they never unevaluated, but that doesn't in fact affect the layout by itself. It just says there will never be any facts there, but we're not using this fact to do an optimization. But if you add this unpack um, Pragma to these fields, the representation is the bottom one, which is a, a three word representation, which is basically as good as you could hope in a GC language. Uh, when you see what happened here, we basically got rid of the both pointer and the constructor of this uh, int type. Why does GC not already with the top example decide to have that? Good question. Uh, that was my oh, okay, the same question. Okay. Uh, so it does now, since 710, uh, for certain fields. So um, there's a trade-off. If you unpack the field with 100 fields, like unpack the type with 100 fields, uh, and then you mutate it into pair, right? So you have to copy those 100 fields to make a you know, mutated version, not the mutated, but a new version. Uh, so there's a trade-off. But if the field is basically uh, pointer-sized or smaller, then there's, there's no space loss in doing this unpacking of the problem. There, there are some caveats still, right? If, if GHG might need to rebox values, but yes. In 710, it will do the unpacking, add it after the compiler. So, sorry. Yeah. In that example, what does it do exactly? If you have a strict field of a monomorphic type, like in the top case, uh, where the field would unpack to something that is pointer sized or smaller, uh, you, it will do so. Okay, so, then the unpack pragma becomes superfluous. Yes. In this case, it would. you could write the first thing at this end. And the goal is basically to, by default, do the right thing and get rid of this kind of noise. And in fact, there was one Haskell compiler that did this forever, not teaching. So there's some, some examples. So here's another an analogy, a way to think about this if you're familiar with C. Um, in Haskell, writing bang int, right, so it's a strict field, it's basically like having a pointer to it. It's exactly like having a pointer to it. Uh, writing unpack int, not thinking about the GHC 710 thing, but you don't have to do this anymore, would like be like writing in A, no point. So if you can think about the C structs, like if you can say in C, I want the, the memory layout to be this way, you can translate from the bottom from the top. I wanted a pointer in C, well then I wanted the top one in Haskell. I didn't want a pointer in C, well then you wanted the bottom one in Haskell. Uh, benefit of unpacking, um, save space. And you're removing directions, which are good for caching, because even if this int pair, like on the slide, it looked like all the data was maybe close to each other somehow, right? But when the garbage collector runs on heap, it does not preserve um, locality always of, of different heap objects that point to each other, because it typically does a depth first traversal. So it could move things away, which meaning 
reading the int pair constructor to find the pointers to the actual ints, and then going to find the actual ints might hit three cache lines instead of one. So unpacking will put all the data in one constructor, which is guaranteed to be together, so will help uh, cache, cache uh, behavior. Uh, there's some this caveat here. Sometimes this could hurt performance because if you have an int pair with an unpacked int, you need to take that int to pass it to a lazy function where it expects a box in. You might have to allocate a new box when you pass it to that lazy function. In fact, this doesn't seem to be a huge problem, but in theory, it could happen. Unpacking is really important. Right? You control memory layout. Memory layout is most important thing on modern CPUs. Therefore, unpacking is very important. Oh, and ask your question. Yes, GHC does this for small fields. And to be consistent, in fact, it unpacks doubles, even if they're bigger in a pointer on a 32 bit machine. Okay, so this was the first part about space features. Any questions on that before we move into laziness? So, so how roughly it reduces the memory? Like mm -hmm. factor of two or something? Uh, it depends on data types, yeah. but it, every unpack removes uh, two words, right? The constructor. And then, then you have to do the math with the Uno or Duo. Uh, kind of a thing, right? You have to take an actual data type. You can actually just compute it, which is nice, right? You can take paper and pen and it's computed. Actually, you can probably build a tool. There's some tools to do this for you. But you can actually do math to say, this data type will take exactly this much memory. Um, OK, so how to think about la If laziness means that our program is kind of demand-driven, right? Someone needs a value over here that will trigger some computation, and maybe that'll trigger some other computation. Does that mean to re reason about the lazy program? We have to think about the whole program at once. Like, well, someone pulling over here and something that happens over here, that would be difficult. Like, you don't want to reason about the whole program at once. And it turns out, uh, in many cases, you don't need to you can do local reasoning. Uh, and the way you get there is, is by the following thinking. In a lazy language, we only evaluate the function's body, meaning that actually call the function, if we need the result for definition. Right, maybe you do case f of x, and then we try to pass the match to the constructor. Well, we have to call f of x, because otherwise we don't know what the result is. So by the definition, we only evaluate the function if we need the return value. Therefore, we say that the function is always strict in the return value. Like, we'll never return a function on the right-hand side of the last arrow. Um, and that enables us to think about functions this way. So here we have function max. So simple function maximum of integers. So what gets evaluated when? What like is this function going to evaluate the x? Is it going to evaluate y when? The way to think about this is start kind of a back to front analysis. We start on the right hand side here. So we have two possible branches to return a value from x or y. Then then you ask yourself, okay, to choose which branch to take, which values must be evaluated? Well, we need to know something about integer comparisons. Oh, but but. Assuming that we know that you know, greater equal than an integer requires that you look at both ends, we can say, well, clearly we need to look at both x and y to make this decision. Therefore, this function is strict in x and y, or another way to say it, it must evaluate x and y. Um, so if you, if you want to ask yourself, what, does this fun a function always evaluate something and when, you can start from the back of the function and ask you this question, like, what must happen to pick the branch? Maybe there are many branches in many cases. You can ask yourself all the way up, and then you can say, well, and when you get back to the function argument, you say, well, it will, it will always evaluate x, it will maybe sometimes evaluate y, could be the case, or we will never evaluate z. <coughs> That's a very boring case. The function that never leads an argument, you should probably not have that argument, but it's a theoretical possibility. Um, I mean, I guess it could capture z and return a closure when evaluated with, with touch z or something, so I guess there, there are cases. So you do this backwards analysis. Um, so here, here's an example, for you, you to guess again. So we have a simple function for inserting a value in an unbalanced binary tree. The binary tree works out, uh, has a leaf node, which is empty, and it actually keeps the values in the, in the interior nodes of the tree. So uh, the binary node has a value in, then it has two subtrees, tree and tree. Um, the insert function is a balanced tree. It's very simple. If you just have a, an empty tree, we create a node with the value, and then uh, we create two you know, leaves. If we have a node, we'll check if this value is larger or smaller, uh, and insert it to the left or right subtree. And now the question is, 
which argument is the insert function strict in, meaning that which argument will it always evaluate, not sometimes, always evaluate? None of them, first, second, or both. And hands up for none. Hands up for first. You mean always for every? Okay, always, yes. No matter what, if it gets called with, right? Some int and, and some tree. Okay, and um, not always means it's not strict. Yeah, not always means it sometimes means not strict. Okay. Always means strict. Um, so so uh, first first argument. Always divide the first argument. Always uh, well it's only the second argument. What means evaluate? Uh it looks at its value. How deep? Hmm? How deep? Uh what one level? And both. Okay, someone want to argue for both? Um, in all the cases in the second branch of the insert, you, you use the second argument, I mean, in one way or another, either use y or, I mean, you have to uh, extract its values or its fields. And in the first one, you also need it to use if it's need both for the second branch. Mm -hmm. And x is always used. Someone would argue for the second case. Uh, so in the first branch, uh, where you pass a match for the leaf, you don't need to evaluate x because you just pass it down to another constructor, right? If it's a pointer, you can just pass a pointer. And only in the second branch, if it's not a leaf, you have to evaluate x in order to decide where to insert that. I think no one argued for that too. So. Uh, so, so that the answer is only the second with, with this reasoning. Um, I might have tricked you a bit because it looks like the max case, right? Because I have this max branch going on in the second part. Um, but it's true, it only looks at the second one and it has to do with this first branch, right? So again, remember we start at the, uh, the right-hand side of all the possibilities. We have four possible right-hand sides. So watch things must be evaluated to decide which of these branches to take. And as we said, there is a case when it's enough to only look at the second guy and, and pick a case. Therefore, we don't need to look at x in this first case. We didn't actually, if the node constructor have a strict int field, right? Because that means when we create the constructor, we evaluate x, but uh, we don't, so we don't. So again, we start from the right-hand side and, and go inwards. And then there's one case where we don't need to look at x. And we'll, it has some implications for performance, we'll see later. And, and here's, you can test it, right? You can actually call insert with something that should diverge, and you will notice that in fact it doesn't. Crash the first line. But uh, isn't actually all the mixed? Because in other cases, you have to go to second branch. So, yeah, so, mix, don't, so, don't so mix mixed means lazy. Just, just second. Uh, so mixed means lazy. So strict means always. If it's, as you as say, sometimes it means lazy. Uh, sometimes does not mean none, right? Never. That was an uninteresting but argument. In your that structure leads were kind of at the end of the tree, so. Or like until it reaches. Um, Right until it reaches the tree, at the end it will be the second case. Uh, well, we think about the completely empty tree. You start, yes, because we have yeah, an empty tree, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. but it, yeah, this is the this is boring case. The first case is the boring case. Yes. It only happens so, then. So, in real example, it will be actually most of the time second. Most of the time. But it's still late, right? Because it's still most of the time. Because yeah. the tree could be empty. But yeah, it's so a good observation. The point here is whether the compilers can know that it's always going to be evaluated, right? Yeah, that's good. It's that's, why, that's why always is what we need to use. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because if it's not guaranteed, then, then you can't do anything with this information. And you can try this, you can you can follow this code and see which one writes an exception. Um, if you keep in mind this, what you said, that the right hand side of a function is always evaluated strictly, right? You only call a function if you want to actually evaluate the last thing. That implies that if the return type of a function, t in this case, a function f has some arguments return to t, contains only strict fields, and those fields are types which don't contain non-strict fields themselves. We can tell for sure that a function does not contain, that it doesn't retain any thunks. It doesn't retain any memory. There's no way a function that returns this t1, right, which is also in, holds on to gigabyte of memory. I think, because there is no no point that this gigabyte of memory could be referred to from in the return value. It could use a gigabyte while it's doing its computation, possibly, but not in its return value. Which is a very useful property, because we know that the return value is strict, 
Uh, like we can, we don't need to look at the function internally, right? unless we report that it does something stupid that uses a gigabyte of memory. But our, from our, for our space and laziness reasoning, we can say it returns a strict value. Uh, they have strict fields. It doesn't have any funds. Cannot leak any space. Cannot retain any memory we didn't want it to retain. Uh, there's there's a little star here because if you have a strict field like data t equals c, and you have a field maybe a, a function that's in inside here, you could return a, a c which retains some large variable that was defined for some inside a function. So that, uh, Yeah, yeah, it looks like this. You could you could capture something large inside that closure. But if you don't have closure, uh, you cannot retain it. Uh, and this has implication for our first guideline for, for production quality code. We kind, of, we kind of now covered the preliminaries, like how does it work? And now let's try to apply this to real life design of Haskell code. Uh, I argued that data types fields should be strict by default. And for these reasons, memory layout reasons, and uh, simplifies reasoning about space usage. We know if you return a lazy a strict data type, you cannot have any thoughts. You don't have to worry about it, you don't have to think about it. You don't have to think carefully whether something could leak. Just by design, a function cannot retain memory that we don't want to retain. Um, and so this is number one. If you count the number of data types with strict field in like containers, text, byte string, and some other libraries, I did this once, there was uh, Three that were had lazy fields, some proper design. It's like there's a lazy text constructor, and there's a lazy byte string constructor, which is basically a list. Then it's, it's lazy in the second element. Oh. And there was a third one which was wrong. Uh, it didn't happen to matter so much in that particular case. Uh, it was used very locally in some functions, but, but it was in fact not correct. So this is not like this is empirically what we typically do. High performance is like this. And obviously, it doesn't mean like if you write a high level application, you have it. Like a data type is used twice and has like two fields and maybe it doesn't matter, right? But as a if you want to make things work well by design, this is guideline. Is that true for basic data type? So for what? Just, uh, basic data type, so like either or, uh, or maybe? A uh, good to... question. We'll come to this. It'll be slide number three after this one, I think. Yeah. Um, another note of why why having strict data types help. So consider um, this implementation of data.map. So this is a size balance binary tree that we use to implement data.map. It has you know, an empty leaf or a binary node that has some size field we don't care about. It keeps a key of the map, strictly validated, the value not strictly validated, and two subtrees, the left and right. Um, note that there's, there are strictly these subtrees. So now think what happens in the insert function if the subtrees were lazy or strict. So what happens if the, the subtrees were lazy? If we do an insert, uh, let's say we've got the binary now. We'll compare the new key to the old key and see if we're going to put something on the left or the right. And then we create a new subtree on the left or the right, which one have we decided. If we were lazy here, we would insert a subtree that when you evaluate it would continue doing the insert. But it wouldn't do it now, right? Because the insert will just take one step. And we'll just put a thumb there that says, Whenever everyone looks at this branch, continue to do the insert first before they do something else. Uh, so basically, the next lookup or the next query function would incur the cost of the insert, which is bad also for reasoning about asymptotics because then it becomes a little bit tricky when the cost occurs. It's possible, but it's more tricky. Um, but, but for this uh, slide, more importantly, if we create a, tr a tree right now, we might have things in cache that helps us. For example, yeah, the key and the value that we're inserting is are in cache right now. So do, if you're going to do work involving those keys and values, it's good to do it now when you have them in cache, rather than later on look up and maybe out of cache and you have to fetch them from heap somewhere. And they might be in, in bank search even. So there has a small benefit in some cases on, on caching, you should just be more eager in creating data structures. Um, here's the other one. So there's basically two guidelines. These strictly data type fields, and don't forget the accumulators in recursion. This is a common uh, pitfall. This is basically the fold L without the prime in Haskell, right? If you, if you have an accumulator and you accumulate stuff into it, like in this mean function, use the mean of a list of doubles, uh, 
um, you will put times in your accumulator. Um, yes? Is the, the laziness of Haskell only captured by the strictness of the data types, or is the laziness not as well? Uh, bindings are lazy too, if I do left x equals the, the laziness in other tests. But, but it can be controlled mostly by looking at the data types, which is, I guess, one of the messages here. So you don't have to think of it too much about, should this be let bang x equals, or should it be like some bang on the third argument of this function? It happens once in a while, you have things like this, but mostly not. Um, so if, if you have a accumulator and a recursion, in this case, we have an accumulator which is a tuple, because we can keep the sum and the number of elements in the list of tuples, so we can take the sum divided by the list of elements at the end to the mean. This is probably not the best way to do a mean, by the way, because it might not be very unstable, but let's put that aside. Um, so if you have a, an accumulator, you have to make sure two things. First, that the accumulator is evaluated strictly in fold L does this for us to make sure the accumulator gets evaluated every time around the loop. And that the accumulator itself doesn't hide uh, types. So this is one way to avoid it. The lazy pair actually has two lazy fields. Even if the pair itself is evaluated strictly to a pair, I think we'll still point to a function. So you could, point, you could put like, the sum could be like a chain of pluses inside this thing. So one way to do it is just to use an accumulator, which is uh, like a throwaway data type. It's also possible to do this with bank patterns, by the way. You could put the bank pattern, I think, uh, here uh, here and here, and you will also be fine. But I think the, the data type approach is more fail safe. I have to think, make sure that the data type cannot have any hugs, that they use a function that accumulates strictly, and you'll be fine. This applies if you wrote this recursive function by hand instead of writing full L by you, be, you tend to do it sometimes we write the explicit recursion and then use an accumulator and we don't think about the evaluation order. So this is almost the only one other place where you want a strict bang that doesn't have to do with data types. But, but not putting it in data types. Um, so if you wrote fold L manually, fold L prime manually, you actually have to have a bang on the accumulator. You cannot only put it on the data. Here we're using fold L, so it has a bang on the accumulator, so we just need to care about the data. Uh, another place, um, another application of the same rule, um, it's, but it, but it's a bit tricky. So if you have a monadic code, let's say in the state monad, you call return x. So you do some computation, you say return x. You might try to apply my rule before, like, well, returning x, right, x is a strict data type, it cannot contain any thunks, right, because I designed x to be not containing any thunks. But in fact, uh, the monadic code might embed your value in some other box. The state monad keeps the state around in some little box. So when you do return at x, in the first case here, I have to basically say is take my competition, put it in my data type, right? And then put that data type in the box. But since the box is laid to see, it doesn't <coughs> matter that my school never be evaluated, and therefore you will hold on to. So use the rule of um, I, I always do this, and I don't think about it more. Uh, if you do this, you can apply the normal reasoning of as if you return your own strict data type, even if it happens to the uh, right. Here, we go back to this tree again with the, the lazy base case. Um, uh, as we saw before, there was this degenerate case where we had an empty tree, which doesn't happen so often, but happens. And because this happens, we have base case where we are lazy in some parameters, but very rarely. Uh, you should typically make these strict. Um, it doesn't hurt a lot if you don't, but if you do, the whole function is strict in all its arguments, and GHC will do a better job optimizing it. And particularly, in this case, an insert, it will unbox the key and pass it around in register, for example, every time it does this insert, you know, loop the insert refers to the function. Uh, so you want to do this in, in the base case. Um, and we do this in the container. Example. I think in containers, this particular optimization is like 10, 15% insert performance. So it's not like huge, but it, it's it's good performance. And here we come back to your question about existing data types. So obviously we live in a, in a language and in, in an ecosystem with lots of default data types we use, which are not strict in their values. Um, and then you have to be a little bit more careful. This is one of the cases like you have to be careful is you have to get used to spotting these. Because if, if you look at Stack Overflow when people have problems with performance, often they do something like, I oh, did the computation very nicely, maybe put some bangs there, 
and then they put the result in a pair or in a just constructor or, or a left or right constructor, which was lazy, so in fact, in the end, in, in, in that, all their bank patterns were for nothing. Yeah, because they thought like that anything didn't enforce the whole bank pattern. So uh, if you return something in, yes? If I use parentheses, is that equal to the normal dollar or dollar bank? Normal dollar. So typically, uh, if I put something in one of these, they've actually forced it before, just a dollar bank. Uh, you also use your know, left bank pattern x equal your computation in you know, just x. This would be a bit more hard, but that would be the same, same thing. Um, all right, so that was it on laziness. Any more questions before we get into to inline? You have comparisons with, uh, for example, integers. If in this uh, max example, you have x smaller than y. If you could imagine that if y is the minimum int, yeah. that you don't have to force the x. Or if you have a double where one argument is none, you know the comparison is going to be false. Yeah. Like the equality is going to be false. Okay. Are there any weird pitfalls in any of the eco or or instances where it's like the comparison operations are lazy in one operator. Yeah, it's not guaranteed that the type class can be strict. You know, GHG, if it sees the actual concrete type, it knows that this is the you know, less than equals or ints and, and then we'll not, everything would be fine. If you write the generic function in num, it doesn't necessarily know that, so you might have to tell it to evaluate something if you cannot resolve this statically. Um, yeah, but does it happen in any standard instances? I, I don't know of any standard instances which are not strict. I mean, you can, you can imagine such instances. Like you can represent it in there's some kind of stream of digits, right? I, I don't know if any of this is actually useful properly. I'm sure you can construe one. Yeah? Um, so, um, what's the, so this is related to performance, not really to laziness. But uh, you know, when you insert a function, you're doing, uh, uh, so you have three branches. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, I think it was in, in max or whatever. So you, you were comparing, you know, x smaller, mm -hmm. um, then you were doing another comparison. And I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, do you actually gain by using compare and given ordering and then do... Um, uh, it should compile the same thing. I read it less than in guards or... You're going to all compare in the GHG low level, you're all going to compile the case statement. Okay. Uh, so it, it shouldn't matter. We could, we could double check on a low level, but it shouldn't matter. Um, and it should, you should collapse branches a bit too, if it's uh, clear to what's going on. Yeah? Uh, about uh, your example, uh, the insert in Emma, mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, comparatively small and uh, it is easy to find uh, non strict arguments, uh, but uh, for, uh, for greater code, uh, how do uh, how do, do we find uh, uh, non strict arguments to functions? Do we have any tools? Uh, so GHG itself computes the strictness it thinks the function has. So you can actually dump things on up uh, what's called the core language, which is a simple version of Haskell. And it will actually say what it thought the strictness was. And then you can look at that signature. So like strict, strict, lazy, strict, strict, lazy. A little bit more complicated. You can say, no, that doesn't sound right to me. This, like, this argument ought to be. Uh, like it always, like and then you can look, dig down that argument and say no. Alternatively, some people actually use put bank patterns on all the arguments. Say I, 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 I know this should be strict. So I'm just going to put a bank pattern on here. I, I think that argumentifies the code a bit too much. I'd rather much more of the school of think about what the values you are that you return, you get the strictness there. So in, in, in the map example, actually the best solution is to, uh, well, there's two maps. So the map to the key of value, we just make the key strict in the resulting tree, right? which means that the base case will also be strict, this has a key as an argument, right? first function, first parameter, and it's going to take the key and put it in the node, which is strict. But yeah, GG can compute it for you. The tooling is not, it's not nice, I wouldn't say. Like, I went to the high level thing, which you know, colors your, like in your editor, colors your arguments with some colors corresponding to what GG thought about it. Remember, Hearing Don Stewart saying, uh, you know, leaves uh, leaves should be uh, strict by default, and I remember him saying the spine should be lazy. And um, can, you, can you say? I, I think it's wrong, uh, at least for trees. 
just add, because there's no useful, there's very little useful streaming that can happen. If you have a, a list that's a different story about the trees, I think it's wrong. And in fact, all our trees are in our base library parts. Um, it's, it's a good post by um, Edward Young about uh, you know, lazy and strict spiders. And that's a blog post if you can search for it. Edward Young on his blog. Sorry, maybe a very um, simple question, but what was the original idea of boxing such things as hints and stuff? Like your first guideline is always un unboxed, them, right? Yeah. So what was the original? Because it seems kind of wrong to box them in the first place. Considering so you mean why Haskell boxes? Exactly. Like why, why does it box them? Why Haskell boxes? Yeah. Uh, why why you, they decided to box them? So, so if you're lazy by default, you must be boxed by default. Because to allow a lazy flank at any place, you need to have the field represents as a pointer, which is either pointed to the box or the sun. So once you have that decision, you basically have to be boxed. Uh, so that's but what it's like. I'm slightly confused. So this data type is always a yes, but the function arguments, would, you can still make them straight. Oh, same reason. Right? Lazy, lazy by default language. So I mean, the argument for laziness overall is there are more, if you write a function in a lazy way, there are more functions you can write. Right? You can write a function that only executes correctly in a lazy language, but not in strict language. So basically, they just, they, you just take laziness the whole way. You have a lazy by default language, and that just implies that everything is lazy by default. It's a bit of from there. Yeah, because no. it doesn't look like it's needed to be lazy. Yeah, this is, I think at least on a data type level, I think strict this might have been by default. It matters less on the code, uh, inside the code, so to speak, itself. It's my opinion. But this is with 20 years of hindsight. A bit. Um, maybe better compiler uh, analysis might get at this at some point in the future. So this is basically, I'm not trying to take a moral stand and say this is what we actually do. This is what we actually are successful by doing. Questions? Okay, inlining. So I know you've read some core libraries sometimes, it seems like there's inline pragmas everywhere. Many of them were, are not needed. I think Dawn is partially to blame. Uh, <laughs> um, we inline a bit too much. GHG is actually very good at inlining small functions by itself. It has a, a pretty good calculation. It looks at like what the gain is of inlining something in terms of what's the new static information we get at the full side. Um, so usually you leave inlining alone. There are some cases if you use the rule rewrite system in GHG to you know these rewrite rules, then you might need to inline some more manually because it's a more brittle thing. But for normal code, you don't really need to inline so much. There are, there are cases, but, but like if you write application code, don't bother so much. There's, uh, yeah, don't bother. Um, but there are some cases that GHC cannot inline because it doesn't know what to do. So if you have a recursive function and you're a compiler, how do you inline that? It's like every time you see map, should you inline it again? Right? It will, this inlining would never end. Right? So, so a recursive function says, ah, I don't know how to inline this function. It won't. Uh, you can make it inline uh, the body of the recursive function by wrapping it in a non-recursive function, which is the case at the bottom. Uh, and this is like how we write lots of these small, simple uh, recursive functions. Uh, we have a non-recursive wrapper, and there's a recursive body, and GC will inline the body once uh, in, in the call cycle. It won't inline Go like recursively again, because again, for the same reason it's recursive, but it will inline the body of Go once, and it, that might be show the compiler more opportunity for optimization, expose more opportunities for optimization. So you will see this a lot if you write this write recursive function to support the wrapper style. It is an optimization that the compiler could do automatically, and there's been some experimentation doing it automatically, but there are some, some generic cases that might not help. Um, so it's not on, right, but it doesn't do it. And why, why is this useful? Well, if you have a cheap function like math, right, math does very little work. You just basically look at the element that calls a function. If you don't inline map, the function to call here is unknown, right? Because you pass it as an argument, which means this is from a, an indirect function call. Right? Here's an indirect point to look up and find the location you know, at an assembly to jump to and then jump to that. Uh, that's less efficient to jump to an indirect jump than do a direct jump, which is just a go to do some label. Uh, by making something uh, happen a non recursive wrapper, the body of map could be inlined somewhere. And 
then the uh, unknown call can be resolved. Right? So we inline the body of map in the call side where we, we pass like plus one as the higher argument. Then GC can discover several things. Well, first it can call plus one directly by jumping to plus one instead of indirect jump to plus one. And then maybe discover other things such as, oh, it's an int, and I know my arguments are ints, and I'm going to unbox it. So specialize this function to an int. And I balance it. Specialize it to an int, maybe I can specialize it to an unbox int. And that turns into a loop which just has an int in the register. Uh, it's part of things in registers. So uh, that's the benefit of rewriting something that's working by this time. Uh, it depends on the nature of your functions. So in the case of map, right, you did little work except calling out. If you have a function like data.math with insert with, so insert with takes an argument f that says, well, if there's already value in the map, what do you do to combine the old value? Insert just with does. And there's a lot of work that's unrelated to calling f. It traverses a tree, you know, in several levels, and then it calls f just once. So inlining that is less less valuable. And, and we don't. Uh, so that's kind of rule of thumb. And my function is simple, it calls f used many times. Maybe you want to do this recursive and work the wrapper style. Otherwise, uh, you can't be fine. Um, yeah, and it's a note that. Once in a while, like when we check the lower level compilation results, we, we might find it in line exactly what we wanted, and then we might put it in the back mark, right? Because it has some size threshold. Like, oh, if this, the function in line is this big, then yes. If it's this big, then no. And maybe once in a while you get unlucky, you just wrote on the wrong side of this boundary, and then we can use pragma. But I suggest by default you don't. Um, another pragma I think you should use is inlineable. Uh, it's poorly named. I, I argue it sounds like inline, but, but and what it actually does is says this function's body, right, is defined, the function defined in some module, M1, make it available to other modules. Right? They'll inline it, that doesn't, doesn't make it look cheap like inline does. The inline makes, the inline pragmatic makes the body of the function look smaller than it is, therefore it gives you inline it more often. Inline only says make the body available to other function, to other modules. And the fact is then, GHG at the call side can decide whether to inline. And in a particular case, an inlineable pragma, what it will do is say, if I could specialize some type class arguments at the call side, I would generate a copy of the function that was marked inlineable at the call side. So in this case, we have a function f, which has some ad hoc polymorphism, some type class constraint, a, and it has some body. And at the call side, uh, a is known to be int. And uh, f is, since a is known, uh, since the argument is known to be int and the function is marked inlineable, GHC will generate like f underscore specialized to int function, which is specialized to int, will remove the overhead of uh, this type class dictionary to the indirect calls to the plus, plus method or whatever f would do. So we use this quite previously in, in places like hashable and unordered, unordered containers, for example, in the hash map type, to have every insert function marked as inlineable because it's quite valuable to specialize that function its key type. So for hash map, the key type is hashable, you know, hashable k equal k. So the, the key should be hashable. And then insert takes a k and a b and a hash map and produces a hash map. And specializing that k to an int and figuring out what the hash the actual hash function to use is statically at the call site will remove a bunch of interaction. So that's it's useful. Um, so I would use inlineable if I have a function which has a type class constraint, and I think there's some benefit to it. But sometimes not. It depends really how big f is. If s f does tons of work, and and like you have show a and once upon a time you call show. But if if you think that the specialization of this argument to the concrete type and concrete type class would be useful, then use inline. Uh, it also has some optimizations. Unlike inline, where it will create a copy of the inline function every time, and so you use no inline on f. Every time you see F, even in the same module, inline the body. Inline the body. Inline what we do is more clever. We generate a new specialized version of F and then reuse it in every time. So it basically creates like a rewrite rule. So I created a specialized body and I created a rewrite rule that says if I see uh, F at int, use this guy. So it, it has less code to do. Question? Yeah. Uh, what's the uh, Later, when it is specialized, will it still try to inline it? Yes. Uh, GG has a limited number of 
iterations of its optimizer, barbarian that you didn't run out of those will actually try to inline and do its normal things. What's the cost of doing this? I mean, why, is it, why doesn't this? <coughs> um, so there's a there's a um, there's a flag you pass, so it pretends everything is is inlineable. And I think we just haven't hashed out if it's always a win, and we should just always do it for every type class function. For a small function which has a type class type, GHC already exports them by default. You don't need inlineable; it's very small. But something like beta dot hash map that inserts the big function, so by default will not. Exports its body into the HI file where it keeps things that will be um, So maybe it will in the future. Yeah. How is inlineable related to the specialized program? Where you can basically give a type and say, hey, generate this. And ah, I could question. So the difference between inlineable and specializable is inlineable is call site driven. So specializable, you can say in the, in the module that defines F, I want these three specializations. And GHC will generate these three specializations there. And if the use site happens to fall on these three ones you explicitly enumerated, you're good. I give off this specialization. And Lightable says, I, I cannot enumerate all the way F is going to be used. Please bring F with you and in a call site, in a call site driven manner, decide what to what specialization to do. So it, it's a much better specializable in a sense. It's because call site driven. It doesn't force you to enumerate all the cases. So if it does specialize in one module, then will that uh, specialized version only exist in that module? No, it will be exported. So basically, if you have inlineable in the module here, that gets triggered in the module over here and generates specialization and a rewrite rule. That rewrite will be exported to all people who depend on this module. So you get some better code reviews. Like if, if the leaves have the specialization, then everyone who uses those leaves will get the specialization. But you can still end up with two because you have two modules that don't depend on each other in any way. Right. But it does, it does get to be used, which is nice. Because I did an analysis once for part of, I think, our code base here. Like how, so if you don't have like something like hash map, like keys and values, how many combinations of those do you actually see in a real program? Like specific Ks and specific Vs. And it turns out, um, if you look at the larger and larger code base, it kind of tapers off, right? The possible combinations are you know, infinite, but the actual combinations are the hundreds, maybe thousands. So you, one would make a hope that uh, the specialization will, will taper off, right? Eventually you'll generate all the normal specializations in your program, and every time you use this function again, you can generate non new code at all. So with that, we have a couple minutes, we'll see how far we get. So I would like to talk a little bit about core. So core is GHC's intermediate language, it's a low-level Haskell. Um, it is, uh, uh, it's the language you, GHC uses to do optimizations, so it takes your Haskell program, compiles it to simple Haskell, and then tries to optimize simple Haskell. Um, why could you be interested in knowing about core? Because at the core level, you can answer some questions for sure. Right? Uh, first, evaluation is more explicit at the core level. Um, and you can see uh, if things got you know, unboxed or not. Um, you can see things called inline or not. Right? This is the final after the compiler was done with your program representation. So you can you can still actually happen. Um, and I'm going to walk through quickly a smaller example. So here's a very boring quote unquote program. Uh, it sums numbers. Uh, it has a list of ints and it returns an int. And it's uh, not particularly good implementation of sum, but you know, if the list is empty, it's zero. Otherwise, it's x plus the sum of the tail. So to get the core output from DHC, you can compile with this command line. Uh, the, the core, the core command like that the more important flag <coughs> is the first one, dump simple, which means dump the output of the simplifier, and the simplifier works with core, so that means dump the core. There's a bunch of these de-suppress foo flags, which allow you to get a less verbose core, because the core is quite a verbose language, because it has all the compiler derived information about everything in that intermediate language, which sometimes useful. You can see things like what was the strictness the compiler thought this function had. But often you just want to see the kind of the, the, the main things, and these are two flags they usually use. Module, you know, suppress module prefixes means that even if you inline the function, or if you call like d.maybe.foo, it just says foo in the output task. Which means sometimes it get confusing to see. You might have name functions, but usually this works. So if you do this, uh, uh, yeah, this is the you know, suppress flags. Uh, one thing to notice, 
since JJ done optimization, it has created new variables and deleted old variables. So some of the names you had in your original program, for example, for your arguments, your function might have disappeared, been renamed, etc. So you have to do a little bit of detective work and say, oh, WSGJ was actually probably my argument X. If I actually look at what the function looks like. Uh, there are some, some ways to read it. There's an Emacs mode. I usually open it in editor sometimes, like add little notes because it's so verbose. You might say, oh, this, this, this core came from this part. Right. <coughs> can not help. So here's the core for the sum function. So what else has happened? Well, first, in this case, uh, it has actually been working wrapper. Not for the inline and all the reasons to work wrapper, but what it has done, it says, well, sum uh, takes some some inter turn and it's that sum at the bottom, that's a real sum function. But let's see if we can unbox some of these arguments. And what it says is, oh, the, int, the return value is always a value. So I'm going to just represent that as the unbox the int instead of the, the heap int. And I'm going to call this helper. When the helper gets back to me, I'm going to take the, the int value gaming here, and I'm going to put it in the box. The, the text will match up. That's what's not, in this case, not a very useful optimization. It tries to do these um, worker wrapper things to see if it can unbox things. Because the hope would be that, well, it's somewhat useful. The hope is if the call side at sum, uses the int right away again. So maybe they call sum, some list of arguments, and this does plus seven. If we inline this wrapper, the call site, we can maybe get rid of this rewrapping of the int as a box again to use the result of sum right away. That's why it does this worker wrapper pattern. Imagine if sum was inline with some call site that was using the int. So the call site would do like, it would call sum, get a box, and open the box, do something with the box, and do something else. Right, but if you inline this worker, the, the intermediate box between sum and whatever the consumer is could have disappeared. And, so, and, and this input probably be passed in the register. So you, it re removes malocation and interaction. Good? Yeah. It, it's already very useful here because we actually have this case in the reverse of fault. We are using the result. And it run unboxed, we put in every, every step in the summation. That's Box true. it, return it to the recurse. To the yeah, it's a very good point. So, by the way, this is not a very good sum function. We'll see in the next slide. This yeah. is actually not a good implementation sum. But yeah, you're right. Yeah, you, you, but what you point out is, so what happens, maybe I should have a slide one actually. Okay, okay. Um, yes, go on. So you should see here. So here's when we, so here's the list head, x. Let's call x and add <laughs> some things to it to make it unique. And we actually say, okay, unwrap you know, the int, which was the box this particular element was in, get the real int hash, which is this guy, and then um, call sum recursively to get the rest of the sum and then um, use the native plus on, on the result of this sum. So this was also an unboxed in, actually the sum return unboxed in. Do the native plus on uh, and recurse. Um, so yeah, this it is it's a saving here too. Um, what do I want to say? Oh yeah. Uh, just, just to, to familiarize what the code looks like. Again, um, you have these hashes with unbox types. People see those. That, that, that actually good. The more hashes you see, the better. Basically, means the compiler has removed boxes. So ideally, which is not the case in this sum function, maybe you have time to write one, uh, is um, ideally this sum function should be an accumulator recursion sum function, right? You don't want to re re recurse in a, in a non tail position of this sum function. Ideally, we have a sum function that has an accumulator and, and has the value in the accumulator. And ideally, the accumulator would have that in hash, right? I mean, the accumulator is just like a a machine value which is going to get passed in the register or whatever, whatever time we go around the sum loop. So you would like to see your functions, at least the, the, the worker parts of your functions, to have type which like blah blah hash, blah blah hash, blah blah hash, hash hash hash. Okay. And that's good, it means that GT has removed uh, interactions and boxes and stuff. Some things cannot be unboxed, like there's no unboxing of an int list. It's in, definitely data structure will leave, lives on the heap, it will never be unboxed in that manner. But you like to see hashes. Um, we always said that it split this function, uh, yeah, and it has these primitive operations that you will, that will apply. So plus, plus in Haskell on int is defined as take the i hash, you know, take out the value, take the second i hash, take out the value, apply the native, you know, plus hash, native one machine instruction addition of the two, and wrap them in the new i hash box. And since it has unboxed, some things have removed all these boxes. Will actually use you will see the use of the unboxed uh, plus operation, which is just a, a machine structure. 
and yeah, this this sum function is crap, right? It should be uh, with the NASA accumulator recursion or using fold down or something. Uh, and there is a note that uh, I can see, oh, it's not in this version of the core. So sometimes, uh, I think I, I got rid of it, but there will be notes in this course saying something like, uh, inline mean. It's, it's a, something GHC has stored in its internal representation of the, of the worker function saying, I tried to inline me really hard. Because a specific for if we inline this wrapper, we might get rid of an indirection. So if you compile this code without uh, suppress ID info, I think is what I put it in here. Without this guy, you will get more data, but you will also know things like that. DHC thought that this function is really inline, or it, it, it will say things like, I think this function is strict in my argument. How does the GHC um, differentiate between Haskell and the core? Uh, Oh, can it detect that it's not uh, Haskell? Uh, it, 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 so it, it, it can, core can never input the GC up here. So basically, Haskell comes in up here. It's a desugar stage. Right? Yes, core. can it compile core? No. Can you give him core? Uh, well, core? no, it's not quite true. I think we can actually have core files now on the side. No? Because then you can kind of have your own optimize. Yeah, it. yeah. Um, there was, I think, no, not, not now. Um, there was a particle external core some time, but no. Right so you now. cannot feedback this core file. Yeah. Okay, you have you have a plugin function, which is what uh, Hermit uses. Yeah, so there's some plugins, plugins that you can in the middle of the comp compilation process and maybe do some fitting, but generally no, you can't find for And we'll put this in my last slide, apparently. Uh, I don't know how to that one. Uh, it's in, I don't know how to So I was that. How can I be improved? Uh, so the main reason some is bad can be seen here is it's not tail recursive. The, the, there's where we see the sum is bad, uh, which means it will basically create you know, more stack every time you call sum, and because we have to wait for the other sum to return before doing this addition. So what it should be is have be sum int list of int to int, and the first parameter will be in, a, in the accumulator, um, and the core we would get. Percent anymore. Let, let's not rewrite some now, but yeah, we should add an accumulated recursion. Try it and, and see what the core looks like. And you will see there will be more int hashes, which are good. Uh, and uh, you will see that this reboxing of the argument. Uh, um, I must have read that somewhere on Stack Overflow. Um, I don't know. Anyway, um, so basically, the idea was like you don't need to worry too much about tail recursion because GHC is going to optimize that. Wait, are you saying that you should make your functions tail recursive as much as possible? Uh, if, if it can be, so GHC will not rewrite that the non tail recursive function to tail recursive function on everything that happened. Um, so you, if it's something that should be tail recursive, uh, sorry, it just should be, um, well, let's see if this thing should. If it should be accumulated recursion, you have to write accumulated recursion and not to magically make it accumulated recursive. Or if it should be tail recursive, uh, could be tail recursive, you have to write it in such a way. You should not do these two bytes for you. Uh, and it should usually be tail recursive if it's, uh, for example, if it's late, uh, well, accumulated plus tail recursion in this case, or if you have a lazy function that creates a lazy list, it might need to be uh, recursive in a different way. There's a limit to the argument, of course, which is that I mean, you can always you can make any non tail recursive function tail recursive always right? by just representing the stack explicitly. Yeah. But then, if you do that, you're not going to get any performance gain because you're essentially allocating, uh, probably allocating more than the GC would be allocating. Yeah. But in cases like sum, where the accumulator is not a full stack, so it's just an integer that you can then probably end up doing less allocations in your uh, so yeah. it all depends on the shape of your accumulator. Yeah, the yeah, accumulator must be something that gets collapsed. Right? If, you, if you keep accumulating a list, it might not be helpful. If your accumulator always grows, then don't. If your accumulator reduces in each set, then do. Yeah. Is that a good rule? Yeah, that's yeah, good. good rule. So this, this talk, you say, this implementation of sum because it doesn't perform. Uh, sorry, this implementation of sum is bad because it doesn't perform as well as it could do. In another talk, the presenter might say, this implementation of sum is bad because it doesn't use fold. Yeah. 
Yeah, and so I, you have both worlds. Yeah, so fold L with like the explicit tail recursive sum and the fold L version implementation of sum would compile to the same core. I just made sum explicit here because it's easy for us to see what's going on. I had a summary slide which disappeared, so I'll try to remember my summary. Uh, use strict data types uh, by default. Um, do try to do back of the M envelope calculations on your data types, especially if you're going to retain lots of them in the map or something. Try to figure out how much memory would, memory would this actually take. Uh, your accumulator should be, be strict. Uh, there's a couple of these rules of thumb, like return, you know, return dollar bank, and uh, try to use those. Uh, Reading query, I don't, I'm not saying it's, it's mandatory to write with Haskell. It is a useful tool. I find it pretty interesting. I can see what the compiler is up to. It's kind of interesting to understand what's going on at lower level. It's not necessary, but it can be useful in some cases. Um, this is a question, but it, it's, it was a great talk because that's not the kind of stuff they uh, show you in introductory uh, textbooks. And stuff. Um, when you start, like, what about, uh, I try to. Um, I said, okay, I'm going to enter this coding competition, stick to Haskell. I got a vision of like, performance issues I had. And uh, this is the kind of thing I was looking forward to. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we really need a book, an effective Haskell book. Right? There's effective C++, plus effective Java, which is like, what do people actually need to know when you you actually write code? And it's lots of kind of, I think the Java one is you know structured as like 20 lessons or something. It's very specific. Right? These cases do this, in that case, use this data type. Try, don't try to write your own concurrency because it will fail, stuff like that. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> Beginning to book. Yeah. What, what more questions? I, uh, I was thinking if I start in, um, programming a software, can I start by not thinking so, about, so much about optimization and uh, then uh, when I'm done with functionality and start uh, measuring performance uh, and start applying these techniques, would, would I have to rewrite a lot? Uh, I would, the problem is that the rewrite a lot, but I would say no, it's not a great strategy because, so, so first, I've been trying to get good performance by design so that you don't have to think about it. Like, particularly, say, you stick to the strict data fields, right? You just stick to that and hopefully you don't have to run the step in the end when it says, you, something is wrong, now you have to think about it. And there's also something particular with strictness and laziness. Let's say you say, oh, I think my me application is leaky memory. I'm going to add a bang here. It's, oh, it's still leaking memory. That's bad. I'm going to remove this bang and add a bang here. Oh, it's still leaking memory. doesn't work. It could be that these two bangs together would be enough to force the value. And uh, we, we want to avoid this kind of uh, guessing, sprinkle the bangs, thinking. So we're trying, I'm trying to like, assign uh, your program perform reasonably well. I'm not saying like, do everything like the 10% you get for making the base case strict. Eh, okay, maybe like, if you're not writing data structure, it doesn't matter. But I really would say do the strict data type fields. You don't have to go to Stack Overflow like two, two weeks before you're going to ship because it might have applications in eight gigs of RAM. I have no idea why, why this is happening. No, but, but I think he, he, he hinted that is it possible to use top down approach? So to optimize after you already have the work of the program, or you have to? It's kind of include optimization in your design work. It, it clearly is itself. possible to do that. So, so is it the same? If it's but the same. Like we, we don't, like, so when I write C++ code at Google, I don't do it there either. I, I don't do the, I think this is this dog tooth quote which has been uh, abused endlessly, right? He's talking about small inefficiencies in C and people think it's an advice to to not think about computation when they write computa code that does computation, right? We, we are in the business of writing programs, we do computation, we should think about how the computation, what the shape of this computation is. Now, of course, sometimes it doesn't matter, right? If you're writing things that call the database, takes the stuff, and dumps the donation mail page, that's all it's doing. You could probably do all kinds of things and it'd still be fine, right? And the same, you do judgment. But I find, as an approach to write production quality software, it's very hard to write 150,000 lines of code first and then try to patch it. Because maybe, maybe your, your approach was bad, right? You have shows a data structure representation, which will take you know, the 64 gigs of RAM, and now that's okay. Then you have to rewrite because you, you didn't do this back at the envelope calculation. So, uh, or you you got them in this, this leaky mode and you try to lock these models. I don't, I don't think it's very. Difficult. I think it's better to 
just less, like we do correctness by construction and try to say, well, I, I can write this data type as a, an you know, algebraic data type which has these constructors because that enforces that this cannot happen. I want to do the same with performance. Right? I'm going to construct my code and my data type such that this cannot happen or very unlikely to happen. And then I can I have to worry about it, like in my happy coding mode right now. I have to think so hard. I'm not very good at thinking hard. So I, I really advertise the, uh, by design approach. Uh, my understanding is that uh, an intermediate presentation, uh, I'm guessing after, after four is C minus minus. Mm -hmm. Is there any way of um, dumping that as well? Yeah, it's a function like D dump opt CMM. Uh, and it's all the D dump ASM. I think unless you're working on very core data structure libraries, you know, byte string text, you will not want to do this. I mean, it's very educational, I find it's really fun, but you don't need to do this. I do it for, for the hash map data type, right? Because I care about exactly how the instructions that copy one interior node is laid out, when the pop count instruction happens, right? but something you should have to worry about. Yeah, yeah, no, it's fine, yeah, do it, so, you know, dash, Edam of the It's quite readable. Yeah. Uh, this was not a part of the talk, uh, but uh, you were talking about performance, and I have to ask. Uh, there is a topic of uh, the stream fusion and such, mm -hmm. and uh, I get confused about it. Uh, do we have uh, some guidelines uh, for making sure that uh, this code will get used and this will not? Yes. Um, Let's see what, what, I don't remember them. So they're basically, the guideline is, I think if you use stream fusion, you need to inline harder. You need to compile with O2, because there relies on optimization called constructor specialization, which I think is only on on O2. Um, I think those two are it, that I can remember. And another one? Uh, just as a hint, there's a small package called list fusion bro. Um, for list fusion and stream fusion, which is a function that does nothing of type list of A to list of A, and you put it in your code, and if it's still there at the end of the computation, it will throw an error. So um, <laughs> it's something that you expect to fuse away, and you can make your assertions about what you expect to be fused. So it's something that helps to, to, to ensure that whatever you think is a nice fusion code stays like that. There's also a flag like D dump simplifiers, simple stats will tell you how many times things fuse. It's not super helpful because it's like, a, I think it's used 12 times, but you don't know how many times it was supposed to be used, so maybe it's not very useful, but it's, an, it's a hint. If you have a very small program, you can look at it and say, oh, I had a map map here, and there's no map map fused rule triggered at all, so that's simple. Other questions? Thank you, Amor. So that was the guideline, I think, originating from the same talk that keep the data type strict, but keep the functions lazy, and the last part is a bit contradictory with adding the bags for fixing the lazy base case and stuff. I mean, how do I know when to stop not just putting bang on all my arguments? So I think my advice would be, okay, data type is strict. There's a finite num innumerable cases where that is not enough, like accumulated recursion, and the rest doesn't matter so much. That is, the, so um, you have to do the accumulated recursion. Like if you don't, it will take O n space instead of O one space. But that plus the, the strict data type, and maybe the return dollar bank, because there like, was four cases I enumerated, I think. Those, those you should, at least three of those you should probably do, and one you know, maybe it's optional, and the base case is kind of optional. And the rest, keep lazy. Doesn't matter so much. That's it. So for the just constructor, you would advise to always uh, put a strict annotation? Yeah, I would always do just dollar bank. But is there kind of pragma to to seven No, so no. Uh, so there is some things we could do there. We can try to add a feature to GHG so you can make polymorphic fields uh, strict in type signatures. Like we're like just bang it as types. Sure. Maybe we could do that and have a type polymorphic. I'm not quite sure how that will work out. Or we could try to add a version of the just uh, maybe type that is strict. This makes some work there, but it really, hasn't really happened. So the pragmatic thing to do today is. Yeah, it's all right. Actually, I have a question about this recursion function because that seems to be a very good recursion function in the sense that it's naive and kind of very obvious. And so, does it mean that GHC doesn't actually know know about this very obvious type where there's 
than one operation before. Yes, so it was not Taylor recursion because there was plus. You had one plus some. No, I mean, GC doesn't it doesn't have. That it's not possible to optimize. It, like it's kind of. I mean, so you could have like a rule-based kind of optimization engine, but this, oh, if I see this particular pattern, I'm going to do X. GC doesn't really generally work like that. It has general optimization rules, and I don't think there's a general rule that captures this well enough, like, except with simple cases. So just by the right. I mean, the right way to do it here is to use the default Alpine. So the sum example was for you know, pedagogical purposes, but really use the high-order combinators, and, and they embody the right way to do this. More questions? All right, thank you. Lunchtime, I think.